Hello, everyone, and welcome to Microsoft Learn Live. I'm Brandon Martinez, and I'm joined by my colleague and fellow co-host, Stephen. Stephen, say hello. Hey, how are you doing? Glad to have you with us. Excellent. Stephen, great to be presenting with you again. This is our second time talking yeah. bicep. I'm very excited for today. So today, yeah. we will be talking about managing multiple environments by using bicep and GitHub Actions. As always, you can follow along with these modules at the link below or scan the QR code. Yeah. And we are also joined by our moderator, Josh. Uh, he will be in the chat. Feel free to ask questions and he will be there to answer you. As always, please follow the code of conduct, which should be posted in the chat. But we really look forward to hearing from all of you during this live and interactive session. So let's talk about learning objectives. We're gonna to learn to deploy BICEP files to multiple Azure environments from a workflow. We're gonna reuse some of those workflows to avoid repetition. And we're gonna talk about using secure parameters for each of these environments. To kick us off, I'm gonna hand it over to Steven, who will be covering the first part of today's module. Steven? Oh, thanks, Brandon. And you know, to me, this is a, really this topic is just near and dear to my heart because setting up demo and dev test environments is something i've had to do across multiple jobs you know a long time ago i worked for a public safety software company um, and deployment tools really didn't handle all the setup for me uh, scripting was fragile uh, i did lots of powershell back in those days because uh, i was often going to laptops with unknown state so over time right the uh, our scripted deployments got better and VMs really helped us provide a consistent starting place. Well, the cloud just makes this so much easier. Yes. So we're going to look at how we can take what we're, we've been doing with BICEP and GitHub Actions and take advantage of those workflows to deploy in a repeatable way, not just to one environment like production or to a dev test environment, but multiple environments so that we're exercising, this, uh, we're exercising our steps the same way every single time which gives us a great, um, a great experience. Now, the scenario that we have for today is we're going to be an Azure administrator for a toy company, and we have an app that deploys out, and we um, eventually we want to have a production and a test environment, and eventually, right, uh, we have to integrate with a third-party API. We have a test API URL and a production API URL, and we don't want those things to get mixed up. So we want to make sure that in our deployments. We're sending the right settings to the right place, um, but that we're deploying things the same way every single time, right? All right, so what are we gonna do to do this? We're going to extend our workflow to deploy to multiple environments in Azure um, from GitHub. And once we do that, we'll also then update the parameterization so that we can send the right settings to the right environments. So it's a lot easier one if we can get ourselves an understanding of environments, which you're going to walk us through here in just a second. Um, and then I think you'll, it'll really become crystal clear as we walk through the examples uh, that yes. we're going to do. So why don't you tell us a little bit about environments, Brandon? So yeah, we keep using the term environments and environments could mean a lot of different things. So we're going to, we're going to kind of set the focus on, what it means within the realm of GitHub specifically. But environments essentially are areas where you can deploy your code into specific, let's say, use cases. So there's a lot of different types of environments. You may hear a lot of different terminology. And while we're going to talk through a couple of, or a few rather, different types of terms you may hear for an environment to describe it, just know that your organization, your teams may call these different things. Uh, really, it comes down to you know, your, your kind of ecosystem and where you're working. But we'll go through a few of them. So for example, you may have a development or sandbox environment really meant to allow developers to either test code uh, after they built it. Maybe it's a dedicated environment just for them. Maybe it's for the whole dev team. It's a way to sandbox some changes in a real world-like environment. Another one may be a test environment. Uh, a term actually I hear often is test or QA, 
often interchanged uh, as terms, but a way to run either manual or automated tests against those changes to make sure that the developers have verified it in their environment. And now that it's moving into a, let's call it a non-developer environment, uh, that those changes actually do work the way they intended. Uh, integration environments, these are often used for system, system to system or service to service type testing. Uh, maybe an environment, whether it relies on a third party API or could um, you know, affect maybe a, a system that you've built, but isn't part of your smaller module within your application. User acceptance tests or user acceptance testing, also often called just UAT environments. These are generally exposed to stakeholders in the business. So after you've gone through dev testing or QA testing, and you finally have an opportunity to show it to stakeholders, this is an environment that tends to be a little cleaner, set up so that business stakeholders can go in and verify requirements, making sure that the changes that they've asked for uh, actually do work the way they intend. <clears throat> and once we get through some of those, what I generally call lower environments, we start getting into the ones that are heading towards production bound or production themselves. So you may hear pre-production or staging is a very common term. And really that's kind of your, your final effort to make sure everything's in a row, that you're ready to deploy, and that you're going to take these changes and make them truly live for your end customers. Whether those end customers are internal or external, like in SaaS type applications. And then of course we have production. Production is what is live. That is what people are using. And often is the, the most important environment. That's what runs our businesses. That's what actually has those live changes that end users experience. And then one other type of environment we're gonna call out uh, is a demo environment. So maybe it's a, a smaller subset of features. Maybe it's production-like, but scaled down. Oftentimes these are created to give a demonstration of your software, your services to either a targeted set of users. Maybe it's used for things like training or for sales teams so they can demo certain things without necessarily running the risk of doing it live in production. So, so Brandon, um, you've just went through like seven different environments. Does everyone have to have all of these? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have personally been in organizations that have almost all of those environments. Uh, yeah. My general recommendation is at a minimum two yeah. production and some non-production. You know, you don't, you don't want to do it live as they say, <laughs> but you want someplace to be able to test changes. Yeah. Minimum two, ideally three, because your first one, right, you're you're going to have some environment that has gotten some rapid change. Maybe it's got some failures. Your second one, you're introducing a little more stability, and that gives yeah. you a chance to practice upgrading your environments, at, you yeah. know, because we're going to have data and things like that. And then once we've validated that works in that second environment, then moving on to production, we have a high degree of confidence that production is going to work. Yes. Now, you can have more, um, but I, I, ideally, ideally three at three at a minimum. You know, maybe maybe two two can make it work, but all right. I would agree so, with you on the three. I, I yeah. do like that with the changing of data, making sure things upgrade. Three would be ideal. Yeah, as a starting point gives gives you a chance to practice like you play. So exactly. All right, let's 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 keep moving forward here. Yep. So environments in your organization, as we said, you're you're going to see some variation in there. Um, here we have tests going to production. Now within GitHub, we have that same idea of environments. Now here in this, this screenshot, we have dev, staging, and production. And again, it could be any combination. Later in our demo, Stephen will walk us through and actually show this process together. But just know GitHub has this idea of an environment and it allows you to start bringing things together for that environment, whether it's secrets, connection strings, et cetera, for that specific environment. In addition to the environments, we also have the ability to set up what are called protection rules. So this allows you to set up whether it's required reviewers or maybe you want some sort of delay before going live into your environment. It gives you some control over what happens there before you actually go live. Yep. And as already mentioned, 
uh, the ability to store environment secrets. So again, when you're going to different destinations, odds are there are going to be either configuration changes, such as going to different databases, or maybe you have different monitoring endpoints, or it could be just some sort of configuration during the deployment that you want to apply to that environment. GitHub Actions allows you to keep that at a per environment level for secrets. And then of course, since we're talking about workflows and automation and deploying to these different environments, it's gonna be beneficial to keep track of what actually happens there. So in GitHub Actions, we have the deployment history that shows a per environment breakdown and allows you to track what happens there. So I think this is pretty cool, right? Because you've just described, you know, how I can, how I can define my environments in my CI CD pipeline. I can put some constraints or some controls around them. So that's going to help me with my auditors, right? As and the deployment history as well, right? We're gonna we're gonna have a history of what happened at any point in time along the process. We've got some logs and, and things. All of this helps build a compliance case for us, in addition to improving our operational capabilities, right? In in improving our experience in building and deploying our software. So it's like a double win. Right. Yeah. And actually speaking of auditing, that's a great point because in that deployment, one of the, one of my favorite features actually is you can go to the exact commit that that yep. deployment originated from. So going back to the idea of those different environments, and this is where it's beneficial to have multiple, let's say a bug creeps up, right? Between yep. dev and QA or test. You probably want to know why that bug even came to be and being able to go to the actual commit for that release or that deployment will help you isolate that bug. Because if the bug wasn't there on the previous deployment, but now it is, you essentially have two commit checkpoints that you can compare against and see where that bug came from. Yep. All right. So how do we, how do we link our deployments to an environment? So just like, many different facets of, of GitHub Actions. It's through your YAML, and really it's just defining the environment in your deployment syntax. So here we can see just a small snippet of some of that YAML from GitHub Actions. And that third line, we see environment test. So that is mm -hmm. gonna be targeting the test environment that we've configured in that repository. Now, this is one of those cases where we have some magic strings, right? Like the, the name here has to match the name that we configure in our environments. And so um, it's just something to be aware of. We've got to watch for typos if we have complicated environment names. De definitely. Yeah. Watch, watch what you're typing. Don't change names without working with your team, of course. And also just validate that you are, in fact, targeting the right environment when you're building your YAML. So as I already kind of touched on, one of the major benefits of, of isolating environments within your GitHub action is the ability to target different resources. Now, those resources could be more tangible things such as, you know, a SQL server, a Cosmos DB instance, but can also be things like identity. So, for example, in this um, diagram, we see that there's a different workload identity associated with this environment. So you want to make sure that that workload identity is properly set up and that you are specifying a work workload identity for each environment that you plan to deploy to. Yeah. And, and that's, that's important because that means my test, the, my test deployments and things that are targeting my test environment can't modify my production environments. And we can create as many walls here as we want. So we could go to different resource groups. We could be in different subscriptions completely. We could be in different tenants. Right, um, we we have the we have the ability to segment these things out um, in our pipeline, so we still have one pipeline, but that could target um, vastly different Azure environments, uh, or or at least environments where you know my workload identity can't modify things outside of its environment. Yeah, and that is very very critical, especially as we talk about delivering value in those end environment, specifically production, right? Keeping production as separate from any sort of test environments or anything like that. We want to make sure that isolation is occurring, especially in that area. But 
there may be compliance reasons, control reasons that you need to keep things isolated between these mm -hmm. environments and using secrets and things such as different identities are really going to help you there. Excuse me. Uh, so with environments, we have the idea of the federated credentials. So mm -hmm. when you're building these uh, sets of credentials, this is all done you know, within Azure, whether through the portal or the CLI, and we'll actually be doing this in one of the demos. Uh, it allows you to securely connect from GitHub Actions into your individual environments. So again, just reiterating what we already talked about, and I like to reiterate on this because it's very important, yeah. setting up those separate identities, the federated credentials, is vital. You want to make sure that you do that for every environment, and they're scoped appropriately. Permissions down the road are all set up appropriately as well. Yep, that's, uh, that's really important. Um, and the federated the, the, the federated ID stuff is makes that process so much better and so much more secure because now um, you may have seen the uh, the GitHub Slack uh, issue that came up um, over over the holiday season uh, where some key, some authentication keys got compromised. In this case, there are no permanent keys; they're constantly being rotated with the federated identity. So that helps doesn't doesn't eliminate completely, but it really helps. Uh, address some of that some of that problem. Exactly. So, now, with our environments, we have a lot of similarities, and so we can take advantage of the uh, of our automation capabilities to really um, handle a lot of the a lot of the similarities um, with reusable workflows and with other um, kind of templated out automation. So when we're deploying to multiple environments, we really want to keep the steps the same so that we're doing that practice as we play. So that, and so that, you know, when we deploy into production, we've probably already deployed 10, 15, 20, 100 times into our dev and other environments so that, that those steps have gotten a real workout and we found where their problems, right? So we'll, we'll take a look at how we can set up our workflows so that we're always using those same sets of steps. Now, uh, to create those reusable workflows, we can take advantage of uh, uh, the ability to separate our definitions into different YAML files. And what that allows us to do is to, um, to number one, to reuse those sections in different workflows, um, but also to keep the amount of code in a particular file smaller. It becomes easier to think about. It becomes easier to, to manage. And I don't have to necessarily have some copy paste in my main workflow. I can just refer to this job. And so then if I have to update it, I update it in one place rather than in two, three, or four, you know, depending on how many environments I have, I might have the same set of steps multiple times. So, uh, so the reusable workflow lets us do that. Now, uh, we have the workflow call uh, trigger, and that's what lets GitHub Actions know that this workflow can be used, um, right? So other triggers that we might have are like timer triggers or on push or on pull requests, right? And so this, this particular trigger is what we would use to create those reusable workflows. Now, the... In order in our main workflow, or where we want to use that reusable thing, we'll use the uses keyword under the job to tell us which uh, which reusable workflow we want to use for that. Um, there are other parameters that we can add after that, but the uses keyword is the important one that points us to the uh, to the workflow that we want to use. We can use local files or we can point out to other stuff that's on GitHub. So uh, I have a question for you, Stephen. Is yeah. There, is there any limitation to the number of uses in my, we'll call it a parent workflow, to call to some of those child workflows? You know what? Um, I don't know offhand. Um, I think if you're if you're getting to a point where you think there may be a limit, that's pr you're probably doing a little too much in your workflow. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Like, yeah. like, I, I don't think that should be, 
like like maybe we need a little bit more segmentation in in what we're doing um right uh because there's probably a little too many moving parts at that point um so uh do you know offhand because since you asked that question <laughs> or, or is um, it just a point of curiosity uh i i don't know if there's a documented limit but i actually like your answer uh, yeah. i would say that if if you're getting to the point where you're worried about limits that's a great opportunity to maybe refactor a little bit and yeah. streamline what your workflow looks like so now how do we how do we deal with so so when i have a reusable workflow I need to get information into it so that it can operate on my project, right? And 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 on the particular environment, perhaps that we're talking about. So we can provide inputs and secrets into those called workflows. They're not going to have the same access to my environment um, that the that the host workflow or the main workflow that's running has. So it has. We have to define specifically what we want to allow in. And. So that's going to look like um, that's going to look like this, and we've got a you know our workflow call. Then we're going to define our inputs, uh, our environment type, secrets whether they're required. Uh, so inputs are going to have a required option and a type, very similar to uh, you know what we've done in Bicep before uh, in terms of parameters. And secrets are just going to be whether they're required or or not. Um, and then, and then the name. So then when we use, do that, our, our uses in our main workflow, we can provide a width to provide our inputs and secrets to provide the secrets. So the width, uh, the width is our helper there for any inputs that we're going to have and secrets, obviously for secrets. Um, now, we can, we, one thing we want to make sure, I, I, I said it a little bit before, but we cannot use the environment keyword to refer to a workflow's environment variables from our, uh, kind of from our nested workflow or from our, our reusable workflow that we're calling. So we need to pass those, we need to pass in anything that needs to be used. And that helps with isolation, it's a security measure, really, yeah. right? To make sure that nothing is leaking out. Again, when we're thinking about federated credentials, right? You don't want those yeah. just to be openly available to a workflow. Uh, and right. actually, uh, one, one quick note on that is, um, you know, we've been talking very much in the confines of like a, a business environment, but really this could even apply to open source projects, right? Yes. And if you're deploying to, um, you know, something that's publicly available, you don't want a rogue pull request to be able to gather information and maybe leak it somewhere. Right. And, and as I mentioned, like in this, in, in this example here, we're pulling from a local file, but you can refer to them in any way that you can refer to other GitHub action capabilities. So you can point to a particular repository uh, to uh, another repository that may have reusable workflows and so one of the things we want to see in those reusable workflows is a very defined um, set of inputs so that you know what data is going into this thing so and what it can operate on. Because yep. as you mentioned, right, like you don't want it to accidentally reach in and grab your federated credentials and print those out into the log. Right? That, 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 that might not be so handy or do something with them, right, uh, yeah. that you don't expect it to do. So we actually have a question uh, that came yeah. from the chat. So does a called workflow pick up any context from the caller. So for example, an Azure login, or should each called workflow log into Azure separately? So each called workflow is gonna to need to log into Azure separately. If we can go back uh, a slide to the called workflow and inputs and secrets. Um, yep, that one. So we're passing in the information into this workflow um, so that it can do its own Azure login. Right. So, and because our workflow takes these things, we would want to be very, uh, very cautious and scrutinize the action that's going to, that's requesting this information. In this case, we fully control it. So, you know, I, I'm not as worried, but if something else needed this, needed that those credentials and it was somebody else's action, I, that's something I might want to do a code audit on before I actually went and used it. 
Um, so the, the workflow doesn't pick up any context. Everything has to be passed in that it needs to care about. Yeah. And thanks for the question. Uh, appreciate it a lot. Yeah, thank you, Phil. And, and um, I, I think Brandon mentioned at the start, yeah, please ask your questions as we go, because that's why we're here. Yep. All right. So I think uh, last, last thing we want to mention about uh, these reusable workflows is we can set conditions on these things, just like we can set conditions on anything else inside of uh, inside of our uh, workflows. So we've got uh, an example here where we're using the environment. We're checking the environment to see, okay, we're only going to run that particular shell script if we're in production. Um, otherwise, we'll always run the environment and, and we can take advantage of that environment setting with that inputs environment type. So I, I've personally used this quite a bit, um, specifically thinking about like test environments. You might not want to run a full suite of tests when you're targeting um, maybe your dev environment. Maybe you only want to run that on your uh, either integration or QA type environments. So conditions add some flexibility to that standardized flow so that you don't necessarily have to write a totally separate template just for the purpose of an environment. You can instead use these conditions to help you out. So what do you say we get into some code, Brandon? I think that sounds great. All right. So uh, first thing to note, if you are... Um, if you're if you're not playing along at home with the uh, existing uh, learn module that we're covering, uh, we'll we'll have a link at the very end of the presentation where you can go and you can get hands on and follow through these exact same steps uh, that we're doing here. You can give it a try on your own, and I strongly encourage you to do so. Now, um, we are in my uh, we are in. Um, Visual Studio Code here. I've done a few steps ahead of time so we can speed things up. So I'm just going to talk through a couple of a uh, couple of things. So the first step that we have um, is to um, let's hop over. Is there's this there's this repository that comes along with the um, with the learn module. It's a template, so we can go in and click use this template, create new repository. I've gone and done that. And so we have under my uh, GitHub account, I've got oops, um, I've got my Learn Live Bicep Actions. I've changed the name uh, because I've done this a few times. <laughs> uh, you can you could probably leave the name the same if if you wanted to. Um, I will point out where what changes we have to make if we change the name of the repository. All right, so we're going to clone this. Make sure it's public. That is key. If you make this a private repository, some of the options that we're going to go through, you're not going to have access to. It, it, uh, it needs a public repository. So uh, once we've got our fork or our actually our templated uh, repository here, we can go back to Visual Studio Code and clone the repository, which as you can see, I've done. And we can confirm that with a little git remote. Dash V, and we can see I'm pointing to the right place. Now, um, once we've got that, make sure I'm signed in to Azure. I've already done that as well. So we have, uh, and I'm going through the PowerShell instructions. There are Azure CLI instructions. So you, if, you're, if your shell environment of choice is not PowerShell, there's an option for you. We'll do PowerShell today. All right. So... We are signed in there. Now I'm going to set a couple of variables for my environment. One's going to be my GitHub organization name. And this is going to help me template out some of the other commands that we're going to run. And then I'm going to set my GitHub repository name. And this is the thing you would want to change to what your repository name is. So if you let if you just uh, if you kept the same name as the as the template, um, you would leave the same name. As, as kind of as a source there. All right. Now, next thing we have to do is create our, uh, the point of this is to create our workflow identities. So we have separate identities that have permissions to go into our, um, 
into the uh, test environment and a separate identity to go into our production environment so that our two steps or two environments can't modify each other. So we're going to create a new uh, Azure AD application identity. I'm going to call it Learn Live Environments Test. I'm going to save that to a variable. And that should return momentarily. There we go. And now that I have that, I need to set up two federations for that credential. So I'm going to take that, you know, I'm going to use that application ID. And here's where I'm templating things out. I've got my GitHub organization name and GitHub repository name. So those are going to be filled in for the subject. And that's what helps GitHub and Azure determine that, hey, yes, you're, you have access to certain resources. And so we're going to let our, our test environment get access. And we're going to let our main branch get access. So those two things are now set. And it sets for a token exchange. So now GitHub can call in and, and get a token to access my environment. We're going to do the same thing for our production environment. In this case, I've got my Learn Live Environments production. And we'll create the mirror image federations, one for our production environment and one for our main branch. And we've got those created. Now, now I need something for them to talk to or for something for them to control. So we'll create a resource group. I'm going to call it, actually, I'm not gonna use this one. I'm going to use this. I'm going to call mine Learn Live Website Test. I want to have a unique name. And I'm going to take my service principal. And I'm going to assign it permissions to because I've got my app registration, so I'm going to create a service principle for my registration, and I'm going to assign it permissions to my test resource group. All right, so now we've got some permissions set there. I'm going to do the same thing, except for production. I've got two different app registrations and service principles, one for each environment. And now I need to put this information into my, uh, you know, into my GitHub repository and into my GitHub environment. Now we're going to print some stuff out on the screen. That's all going to go away right away. So don't feel excited because you're not going to get to use it for, for very long. All right. I'm going to grab this stuff. I'm going to copy it out of the way. So then we'll go into GitHub and use it. Um, all right, so let's go to GitHub. So I, first I need to go to my settings because we're going to set our, our secrets. And I want secrets for actions. We can set secrets for different, um, for, for different capabilities inside of GitHub. I want repository secrets. So the first one I'm going to create is my client ID for test. So this is my service principal ID or my application, uh, my application ID that we just created for my test environment. I'm going to do one for production. Now, because both of these are in the same tenant, the uh, same Azure tenant, I'm going to specify one here. I could do two here if I want, if these were going to be in different Azure tenants. But they're in this case, we're both in the same. And Azure subscription ID is going to be the last one I create. And again, it, if I was in different subscriptions, I would create a different subscription ID. That is all. 
um, you know, depends on how many uh, walls you want to put between these environments. So we can see I've got my repository secrets. And from there, we're going to go create our environments. So this is all the setup that we have to do to get this, um, to get our GitHub environment ready to go. So let's go back to, let's go to environments here. We've got no environments. So let's add one. We'll call it test. And again, as I mentioned before, we want to make sure that our test environment or not to, uh, our, any of our environment names, we use the same spelling. Uh, test is nice and easy. So we'll click configure. I'm not going to do anything specific to test. So I'll just go back to environments. And now we're going to configure production. Now this is uh, these, this environment protection rules. If you have, um, if you're just working on a personal account with a private project, you will not see this. So we, that's why I said this has to be a public project so that you get this particular setting so we can set reviewers. And I will set me. And uh, Brandon, what's your GitHub uh, user? Brandon Martinez. Didn't find it, so all right. I, we won't we won't mess around with that then. Okay, I'm gonna say protection rules. I was just gonna give you permissions to approve stuff, but we can do that at some other point in time. Okay. Um. All right. So we've got a required reviewer for production. So now, in order to deploy into our production environment, we'd have to get approvals. We could also specify, you know, particular branch only particular branches could go there. We can specify our specific secrets. Um, we, so we have the options to configure our environment all from here. So we've got our protection rule. Now, now that our environment's set up, let's update our, our GitHub workflows to actually be able to take advantage of this. So we're going to go back to VS Code. And we're going to start out by creating a reusable workflow. So right now, our, before we get started, we'll, we'll take a look at the existing workflow. All right, we've got a um, deployment. We're going to kick off based on stuff that happens to our main branch. We've got some environment variables that we use all the way through. First, we have this lint job, right? And maybe, you know, this is, this is a good first step, but we might want to do some other stuff at some point in time. Let's extract this and make it its own workflow. So I'm going to make a new workflow file. I'm going to call it lint.yaml. And I'm going to drop in some code. And this is all provided for you in the work in the uh, learn uh, the learn mo uh, learn module that we're going through. And I see on line four, you have the workflow call like we talked yes. about. Exactly. Yep. And so we can specify, you know, where we're going to run, the different steps we're going to take, and all of that fun stuff. So in this case, we're just going to run our lint to make sure that we can build our bicep file. We'll save that. And now let's make a deployment workflow because that's going to be the that's going to be the bulk of our actions, right? But we're gonna, since we have to deploy to two environments. We're going to create one file so we can reuse that uh, in both environments. We don't have to um, we don't have to duplicate code in our workflow because right now for for our deployment we have this validate step which which has a bunch of stuff. Then we do it again. Uh, then we do this preview thing. Then we do deploy, and um, and then we do smoke test. Right. So we've got all these steps. This only deploys out to one environment. So if I wanted to do this for two environments, I might have to copy all of this stuff and paste it down again. So we're going to make a separate workflow file so that we can reuse uh, we can reuse that for both test and production. And eventually, if we wanted, we could have multiple intermediate environments 
all just by changing the parameters that we're using. So we're going to start out with our uh, with our uh, name, our on workflow call, and we're going to define some inputs. So I want the environment type, I want the resource group name, and then I need access to some secrets because we're going to do stuff to Azure. So we need our client ID, our tenant ID, and our subscription ID. Because we're going to use that federated identity, I need to ask for permissions. I need to get access to our token and read some content. If we do not have these here, we will probably bump into some pain. Um, and uh, so we want to make sure we have our permissions set uh, so that we can get access to them. Now, the first thing we need to do is we're going to duplicate that uh, we're going to duplicate that validate job that we looked through. And so we've got this here and we want to check, okay, if we're not in production, then we're going to do this pre-flight flight validation. If we are in production, we're going to run a what if, right? So we're, uh, we're using different capabilities based on the production, uh, based on the environment type that we're in. Then we want to do our deployment. And we're going to say that we need, and love how co copy keeps my indent. <laughs> it's all right. But uh, and it's important to note, you know, this is YAML. So um, it is very indention specific, <laughs> if indention is really a word. Um, it probably isn't, but it meets my needs for today. <laughs> um, and speaking of needs, right, deploy needs our validate step. So once that validate succeeds, then we can go on to deployment. And this deployment process is going to be the same regardless of environment I'm deploying to. We deploy the same way every single time. That, that's, that's how we build up that, uh, that solid experience. Then I'm going to add my smoke test. And again, we need a little bit of extra indention here. Uh, continuing on with my word that doesn't really mean anything. It's a word now. <laughs> It is. It's uh, at least for the purposes of today. It is now a word. Um, and so, if uh, once we deploy, we got some pester tests to make sure that everything responds the way we expect it to. All right. So now, now I've got these workflows. I need to make sure my my primary workflow, the one that gets kicked off on changes to our main branch, actually takes advantage of those. So. What do we need to change? Well, let's go up here and I'm going to get rid of all of this job stuff. Don't need it, don't want it anymore. And I can get rid of my environments because I have this environment stuff is going to change based on the job. So I'm going to leave the rest of this stuff. That should all be fine. Now, um, what I want to do is recreate my jobs and I don't have any customization that I need to pass in here. So I'm just going to say uses lint because it's all that's going to do is check out my code and make sure it builds. And, uh, and the, the build process for the bicep tool does the lints for us. So we, so we get our behavior there. And we learned about that earlier in the previous in a previous Learn Live series. You can go find that if you would like. Um, there's a lot of other great bicep specific content out there. Now, the next thing we need to do is update our deployment uh, or our, our job for deployment. And we want to go into our test environment. Thank you. Um, so we want to go into our test environment. And so I want to make sure it depends on our, our lint job. So if our lint job fails, we should not deploy. I'm going to pass in some environment information and the resource group information. Now I changed the resource group names. So I need to make sure that I change that in my workflow. So I called it Learn Live Website Test. 
So I changed that there. Here we're pointing to our test client ID and then our tenant and subscription ID because those are the same. Now to deploy to production, it's gonna look very similar to this. Again, with the indention. <laughs> and, I, and I also changed my production name. But you can see the, the big difference here is we're following all the same steps, but I've got a different environment name, a different resource group name, and a different client ID, right? And even if I mixed up my environment name and client ID and uh, resource group name, this would fail because my, cl my the client ID doesn't have permissions to the other environment. So that would give me a clue that, oh, I got something messed up here. And that's one of the main reasons to have different credentials for those different environments. If I just use the same credential across both of them, I could have some bleed over in behavior. All right, so now we're ready to get this thing going. So let's add our changes. Get add. And so if we look, I always check before I commit. So I, if when I do a git add period, that adds all the potential potential changes. So I, I like to look at it and see what's what's actually getting changed because I want to make sure it's the files I expect. And this it's a good is practice. Well, you know, once you're burnt, once you've been burned by this <laughs> several times, you start you start checking yourself before before you do the things that are more likely to uh, to cause you cause you pain. So we're going to add that reusable workflow. And now we're going to push this. We're ready to we're ready to push this up. And I'm just going to take a quick double check and make sure. Yep, I got my got my right names there. So let's do git push or domain. Now, if I was following my normal development practices, I'd create create a PR and go through PR review. And um, and for purposes of time, we're just going to our main branch. So. All right, now let's go take a look at what's going on. Now, fingers crossed, I did everything right. <laughs> and we have our reusable workflow running here. So we've got our validate, our lint step ran and checked everything out. So we're already on to deploying to test. Now this process is going to go and run through and we'll stick with the test deployment um here and so we can see it's signing into azure with our federated token fingers crossed this is where things could get inky oh yep we're through we signed in okay we can see our subject claim and that's the repo where we gave it the name of the repo and that um and that uh ref's head there so our pre-flight validation worked out fine it said hey there's nothing wrong we're right we can deploy this and then we move on to our deployment step. And so the, the deployment step is now getting itself ready to go. We're going to sign into Azure again with the same credentials. So fingers crossed, it's all. But now we're targeting our test environment because we're deploying into an environment. And uh, so it's it's checking to see does this does this environment match for this federated identity. And that's why we had to have the two mapping rules, right? So the, the one where, oh. Now we're get, we got some error here. Uh, custom bicep config JSON found. That doesn't seem like an error. That seems like a linter config, um, but it's still the plot. It's it looks like it's still going, mm -hmm. so we'll let it go. Um, there we go. So the the deployment worked. What we can go actually over to our back to our browser. Oh, we're in our browser, so I don't actually have to go anywhere. Good. Should remember that, but 
we're going to go to the Azure portal. And I want to show you a couple quick things before we move on. So we created those federated identities. And when we provided those, the correct URL, if we look in the app registration under certificates and secrets, we see the federated credentials. And when we look at them, um, it will break up and we'll get, we'll get these nice organization repository entity type based on selection type things. And it will show you the mapping, uh, the mapping string that you provided in the command. If this is incorrect, you'll just see the subject identifier. You won't get these nice other fields and it won't fill out the scenario. It'll just be like federated credential. So if you're having a problem, take a look inside Azure Active Directory. Um, this will give you a clue if your uh, registration is looking correct. It's nice to right. see that level of integration between Azure and GitHub. And I really like that you can see like the branches uh, that you're, you're actually assigning for that. Because as you get more environments, Right. Like, let's say they yep. that I have the seven that we talked about before. It's nice to see that it actually is going to the branch I intend and that they are integrated in the proper way. Yep. So we can take a look at our test website, our test environment. It created my resources. We can go back into our uh, GitHub actions uh, or our GitHub repository and take a look in front here and on the front page, there's an environments, right? And it shows that my test environment is active and up and running. And we can click through and get some information on it and all that fun stuff. But let's take a look at where our action is now. You remember when we configured our environment, we said that we needed uh, manual approval. So it's hey, saying that, hey, I've got to, uh, to check this thing out before we can go into production. So I'm going to approve it because I made the change and I think I, I think I did a pretty good job. And <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go forward and do that. Um, so now it's going to go through the exact same process. Uh, the validation will be a different step. It'll be the what if rather than the, uh, the pre-flight check, but it's going to go and do the same thing, but it's going to deploy into the other resource group because it's using those other credentials. All right. We've 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 now gone through, uh, and we don't have to stick around for these steps because we're going to come back to this in in a little bit. So why don't we talk a little bit more about how we can handle the differences um, in our environments with parameters? So why don't we head back to slides, Brandon? There we go. Okay, cool. Yeah. But yeah, let's talk about the differences. <laughs> so if you've been following along with the Bicep Learn Live series, you've already learned a lot about bicep parameters. And if you haven't had an opportunity, Stephen already called it out. I'm going to call it out. Go and check out that content. It's awesome. And get up to speed with this because this is going to allow you to have the flexibility needed in the different environments for configuration purposes. What was it you and I that talked about parameters or was it me and Will? I, I'm pretty sure I did the parameters earlier to learn live uh, about bicep and parameters, but I forgot if it was with you or Will. I think it was with Will. I think we did conditions. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's dig some more into these parameters and how we can use this for environments. Yes. Yes. So a parameter file uh, in bicep is just a JSON file. And we can see here relatively lightweight schema. But the main thing we want to focus on is that parameters block. So here we have a review API URL. So going back to what our scenario is, we're going to be integrating with a third party API. So in this case, we want to be able to take that URL and represent it in a way that can be changed. So if you think back on the diagram we showed earlier, there was a sandbox API as well as a production API. We want to be able to configure that through parameter files to make sure that the environment is pointing at the right third-party environment. And note, this is very important, so we're going to pause for a second. Parameter files should not be used for secure values. There's no way to protect them when you put them in the files, so please don't put them there. There are other methodologies for secure parameters. 
and yep. we'll we'll talk about that more for sure but please don't do that you can reference secure parameters if it's in key vault right um but you yep. didn't but you don't actually put the value in the parameter file correct yeah all right so github actions enables you to store workflow variables uh these are just useful values that can be used uh to between different environments and we can see how that's defined here so uh, we have the YAML syntax now, and we're setting some variables to be passed in. So here we can see uh, there's an environment variable, uh, my variable value one. Notice that we have it on the top line. We also have it at the deployment step as well as in the steps themselves. So there's different scopes in places that you can apply these variables to. Mm -hmm. And again, and, there, and, and, oh, and if you if we had the same name variable, right? Like the, the closest to the action is what the one that's going to be, that's going to have precedence. Yep. Right. So if I define to something for the whole run, but I, I can override it at a different, at a step. Yep. Closest scope. And again, reiterating on this, don't store secrets here. <laughs> yep. Please don't. Yeah, clear text files that are going into revision control are probably one of the absolute worst places that you can put secrets. Yes. Um, Especially and, for like a public repo. So definitely don't do it there. Yes. Yeah. If you do, it isn't insurmountable. Um, you, you, you're you going to want to go rotate your secret. You're, uh, there's instructions on GitHub on how, on how to address this. You have to edit history of the repository to go remove those revisions and contact GitHub support to delete um, any cached pages that showed that secret. Um, and so, so there are ways to recover, but just please, 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 please do not check in secrets and clear text files. Yes. All right, so how do we actually use these? So we, we actually already saw this a bit in the demo, but we didn't, we didn't call it out specifically. So to mm -hmm. use variables in your workflow, there's based on the type of syntax that you use. So the syntax is very similar, as you can see, dollar sign and then the double set of braces. And then depending on the type of variable or parameter that you're using, you just change uh, basically that that reference name. So here we can see environment dot and variable name, inputs dot input name and secrets dot secret name. All right. Just try to change my slides without PowerPoint open. There we go. <laughs> so. <laughs> What's, so what's the best approach? Um, so we, we've learned a lot of different ways to handle parameters um, in both bicep and environment uh, definitions with YAML. Uh, so we want to see what the best approach is. And there's a few different ways, right? So just like with there's different types of environments and what you name them, um, how you use parameters, where you put them, there's different ways. And it's not that one is better than the other. These are different methodologies that you can use. So for example, you could use a managed identity uh, in the context of say a app service that you want access to a storage account. You could add the connection, not storing any of the credentials, but add the connection and use a managed identity to access that. So now the part that would be considered a secret or um, you know, sensitive information isn't stored Instead, you're using an Azure mechanism to allow those two services to communicate with each other. Another way to do it is to take uh, the, let's say that app service and a storage account deployed together in the same bicep template, and then use modules to pull the information in that same template and apply it instead of passing in parameters for it, right? It's all happening within one context. And then you can take that information and securely pass that through. And then Steven, you already kind of touched on this as, as a reference point, but another way is to use Key Vault. So instead of storing the secret directly somewhere, you instead put it in Key Vault and use a reference instead. That'll allow you to still have some flexibility. Like let's say you need to use that secret in multiple places, but without having to expose that sensitive information. Yep, 100%. So. <laughs> no. It's really easy when you see parameters and variables to go overboard. You wanna make sure that you are only defining really what's necessary. There are other ways that you can pull config and such in. So when you are thinking through a parameterization process, try to keep the number of parameters minimum 
because one, that's less that you're going to have to manage. Two, it's going to uh, reduce things like typos, uh, copy paste errors. Even though we have all the yeah. mechanisms that Stephen you just showed us, right, to make yeah. sure that we don't accidentally deploy to production, um, you know, there's those walls and safeguards. Not having to manage a ton of parameters is beneficial. You want to keep that small. Yep. And, and what I like to do when I'm when I'm taking when I'm kind of refactoring a, a, a bicep file for an environment is. If I think it should be a parameter, I'll probably put it in a variable first, and then if I need to if I need to take that input to change it for on a on a per environment basis, then I'll promote it to being a parameter, right? It's a good strategy, um, and that way I can keep my parameters to a minimum. Um, the other option, right, is to make sure you have defaults for all the things that can have defaults. But um, so if you do happen to have a large set of parameters. Just know BICEP does allow you to have a parameters file. We already kind of saw yep. the syntax of that so that you can pass them in instead of having to inline them as part of your actual deployment step. So you can load the parameter file instead. But again, try to focus on keeping that number down where possible. Yep. And then it's, not of, always it's not always possible. So when you have to, you've got tools, right? Right. And then of course, we're gonna hit this so many times, store secrets securely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, not in a file, especially not a file that gets checked into a repo, right. and especially not one that gets checked into a public repo. And just <laughs> just for the record, we're, we're not driving this home just because I've personally been bit by it. I'm sure Steven's been bit by it. Just yep. don't store secrets in that and, way. Well, and I manage subscriptions for a, you know, a set of folks, um, and this comes up often it's really easy to do accidentally so yes so it, that's why we keep stressing it but I and think then to tie this oh i'm sorry yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, i was gonna say so to tie this all together like i said there are multiple ways right mm -hmm. to store secrets pass parameters use values use a combination use what works best for the given scenario and we're actually going to see how to use parameters with bicep in our next exercise so i'm going to pass it off back to steven all right, let's jump into VS Code. And we're going to go through um, adding some parameters to our process. And just for interest of time, um, we're, I've already done this. I've already done all the steps in this exercise. And we're going to walk through the changes that we made, get them checked in, and get them deploying. Um, right. The, the, the interesting thing to show here is what changes we need to make. So in my deployment workflow, uh, we want to take in that review API. And so I add a parameter for the URL. And I, it's going to be a string. It's required. I also need the API key. And that's got to be a secret. So we want the review API key to come in. So we add that to our secrets. So that means anyone that calls this deploy job whether it's to production or test, uh, to the production or test environment, they are now both going to be updated and require those uh, the secret and the and the variable um, or uh, yeah the parameter. Then I can update my jobs where I need to use those. So I'm going to pass those in as parameters to my bicep template in our ARM deploy step. Where I'm telling it to go into my bicep file, pass these things in. Now for, um, and then I also need it. Uh, so I need it in my validation step in both either the pre-flight or the um, what if. And then I need it in the deploy step to actually deploy the step, uh, deploy the thing. So I'm, I'm just adding these parameters in, in my GitHub workflow. Our, uh, my uh, reasonable workflow. Then we're going to go to our main workflow that calls this. And so I'm going to add my width. I'm going to add that review API URL. And so for my test environment, that's going to go to sandbox. And for my production environment, that goes to the live production API. In both cases, I'm, I need the API key. One's going to get my test API key. 
and the other is going to get my production API key. Now, these secrets don't exist yet. We have to go create them. And we will do that in just a moment. But I also need to update my bicep file so that that can take advantage of these parameters. So we're going to add a, uh, we're going to, oh, up at the top. Here we go. Here's where I need to be. I was a little too far down, getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so we need to define a couple parameters for our bicep file. We got a little bit of description to let people know what they're for so that when I come back to this thing in six months, I know what I was actually trying to do and intending. Um, so we've got a review API at key and URL. And then we are going to set our, for our website, it's one of the app settings. So we're gonna pass those values in. So these are the parameters that are getting passed in, the API key and the URL. So pretty pretty straightforward stuff. Should be We should be good to go with this. All right. Now, what I want to do is go into GitHub. So that means I got to switch back to my browser. We're going to go to GitHub. And I'm going to go back into my settings. And I'm going to create a couple more secrets. So I want for actions, we're going to do new repository secret. I want my review API test key. Super secret key but not as secret as production. <laughs> All right. And then I'm going to add the variant for production. And what did I name that? Now I got to thought I had that right in front of me, but we'll go back real quick and take a look at my workflow. I called it review API key production. Yeah, I should have remembered that. Now this is one pattern. Uh, you could also put the secrets into environments. Um, this is an even secreter. And so now that workflow that we defined is going to pick up for my production job. It's going to pick up the production key for, and it's going to pass in the production review URL. And here we have our review API key for the test environment and the test URL. So with all of that, we can get add commit even more updates. And as I did this on a different branch, I'm gonna bring this back to my main branch. It's a little different step. I'm just making the stuff from backup to my main branch. And we're going to get push our domain. And now our workflow is going to be kicking off. We'll go take a look. And hopefully I got everything in correctly. But it's going to go through. It's going to lint our code. It's going to make sure that everything looks right. And eventually we'll get on to our deploying process. We can come check back in later if, if we have some time, but I think we should really get into our knowledge check. Okay. Excellent. 
So, Brandon, uh, for, if this is somebody's new, first time to uh, to a Learn Live, what is the knowledge check se section? Great question. So, the knowledge check, we have a few questions, and uh, there should be a link in the uh, chat based on, on where you're at uh, that links to a place where you can answer. So, you should be brought to a poll. And what we'll do is in each of those questions, we'll read the question and the possible answers. We'll give you an opportunity to respond to the poll. And then eventually one of us will will answer it. So I'm going to quiz Steven. So all he right, should, he should get the right answers because he just went through all the exercises. Uh, <laughs> now, this one's a little tricky because we're going to be looking at this um, YAML template. So I think what I'll do is I'll read the question and then the answers. And then I'll flip back just so that you have the context. OK. All right, let's get started. So question number one, how can you improve the security of this workflow? Use separate workload identities for each environment, add a condition to deploy only when the environment name is production, or create a new Azure role definition. So I'll flip back to the YAML, and we'll give you a few seconds to be able to respond in the polls. All right, so a role definition would let me scope different access. Um, but if I if I create a role definition, I still need to apply it to something, right? Uh, so and that's in that that something would have to have act if I'm only if I only have one identity, like I have defined here, because we've got secrets, right? Um, and there's only one client ID, and that's used all the way through. If I create a custom role, that role gets applied to that one identity. And that one identity would have access to all of my environments still, even, even if it was constrained by a role. Um, so we could add a condition to deploy only when the environment names production. And that, um, that can help us prevent uh, un un unwanted deployments. But again, we still have that same one client. So I think we should be getting I think I, th I think we're, we should get to separate workload identities, and 100% of our live listeners so far have agreed with me. So I think we're on the right track. Well, let's check and see. Answers A: Use separate workload identities for each environment. Good deal. So I'm on a roll. We got one right, <laughs> and my demos Here, yeah. worked. We got three worked, and, and so yeah. Let's, let's let's get to the next one. Yeah. All right. So you need to add a new environment named integration to the workflow. Which of these actions should you take as part of adding the new environment? A, add a new caller workflow file. B, add a new called workflow file. Or C, add a new bicep parameters file. So again, I'll go back so you can see the YAML. So we need to add a new environment called integration. So a caller workflow would be our main workflow. Do we need a new main workflow? Mm, I don't think so. Um, a called workflow is like our deploy job, right? That, that we set up, that was that uh, reusable workflow. That wouldn't necessarily that, that wouldn't if I if I made a if I made a reusable workflow for deploy to production a, a reusable workflow for deploy to test a new one for deploy to integration that would defeat the purpose of making those called workflows right because I want to reuse a lot of the same capabilities so um, my guess is based on your advice Brandon about having having a parameters file if i have a lot of parameters to provide i might have a separate parameter file with all my baselines for test i might have a separate base uh separate parameters file with all my baselines for my production environment so i would need a new parameters file so i could have all of my parameter baselines for integration so it, the the caller and called workflow i don't think gave us much option um but the new bicep file would be the I don't think it's required, 
but it would be the only option there. I think that makes sense. And we've got a split uh, in our mm -hmm. audience. Uh, half our audience thinks that we want a new called workflow file uh, and half thinks we need a new parameter file so, or a new uh, yeah parameters file. So yeah, I think that, I think we're parameters file. And it's parameters file. So yes, your your reasoning was correct. So we want to be able to just specify those different parameters for that environment because we already have the called process. Yep. Yeah. If we created that new workflow, uh, either a caller or called workflow, we're adding some, we're we're adding the duplication that we're trying to take out mm -hmm. with the reusable workflows. The the point there is that we don't have to, in order to deploy to a new environment we don't have to change that stuff. We just have to modify our main workflow to call it one more time. Right, yep. So we would just create something called like parameters.integration.json. Yep, that would All work. All right, third and final question. You need to add a new parameter to your deployment that contains a connection string and password to access a database. Which of these approaches should you consider? Define a variable in the workflow.yaml file, so that's A. B, define a secret in the GitHub web interface. Or C, add the parameter to the parameters.environment.json files. All right. And I don't think we so, need to go back for this one. This is pretty standalone. Yep. Yeah, so connection string and password, that's secrets, right? So if I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to, put it, I, I'm not going to put it in my parameters file because you just told me multiple times <laughs> <laughs> that I should not put it into my parameters file. I, I should not put secrets there. Um, and I think I was pretty adamant that we shouldn't put it into anything that we're going to check in. Um, that it's, so it's probably not A, the define a file, a variable in the workflow YAML. And it's probably not the parameters that JSON that means putting it as a secret into the web interface. And that's one that that's, we, we could put secrets in multiple places, but um, somewhere that is not a file that gets checked in. So it could be key vault. It could be some other secret store um, or it could be a secret in the GitHub web interface. There are, there are a multitude of locations that are more secure than putting it into our revision control. So, I would have to say B for this one. And like everybody agrees pool. with me. The pools are with you. So let's take a look. B. The odds were ever in my favor. They were. <laughs> it helps that we really reiterated on that. <laughs> Defining yeah. the secret somewhere else. Excellent. Well, okay, because we've we've been burned by this stuff, right? And yes. So so learn learn from our pain. <laughs> yes. All right. With that. A summary of everything we've gone over. So we've talked about deploying bicep files to multiple Azure environments from a workflow. We both talked about that and saw a demo of that. Yep. Use reusable workflows to avoid repetition and use and secure parameters for each environment. As always, resource. Oh, go ahead, Stephen. I was just going to say, we've we've actually got, um, we're, we're doing good on time. Mm -hmm. So if we don't if you don't mind why don't can we jump back over to my my oh, yeah. web let's browser check in on that because let's check in on our job so we made the changes to our uh, we made we made those parameter changes right and it looks like our test deployment went well um and it's now asking for for approval to go to production so if we looked into our you know deploy bicep file we can see um uh, Oh, it doesn't really tell us all that much here, but if we, yeah, um, yeah so we've got our template, our review API key. So it, it does show that we are passing in that new, those new parameters, right, right here. And so that all went swimmingly well, and that's good to see. It's good to see we didn't break things because we got enough stuff updated in, in place. Um, but that is really the end-to-end -end experience we want to have when we modify those those files. So a so. quick call out while you're there actually. So notice yeah. oh. the review API key was start out. Yes. So that's another benefit, right? Of, of appropriately assigning the right type 
of of secret that you're passing through. So we saw we can see the URL, but we can't mm -hmm. see the API key. So even our logs are cleared from that value. Yes. Yep. And, and so if it, there's a secret that's defined uh, where that would show up in uh, inside your logs, they uh, they do their best to sanitize all of that out uh, where that value would show up. So. All right, so it, let's just give it approval so it can march along and because it's going to get destroyed in a few minutes anyway, but <laughs> we'll, we'll let it feel successful, uh, get, to, get to see another green check mark. Uh, but we can go, we can come back to our, we can go back to our slides now in summary, but I just wanted to check in on the workflow that we had left off um, so we didn't have to wait around for all the steps to happen. Yeah, thank you for did. reminding me on that. Yeah. Excellent. So yes, we, we saw all of this. And as a <laughs> reminder, um, all of this is available. More information from everything we covered today, the modules themselves and other resources are available here. And more specifically, you can go to this exact module that we went through by following this URL or scanning that QR code. Coming up next, don't miss manage end-to-end -end deployment yes. scenarios by using BICEP and GitHub Actions. That'll be January 18th, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Pacific. So book your calendars. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's a, it's always fun doing these things with you, Brandon. And uh, I really, Likewise. really enjoyed the topic today. Um, please do go check out that module. Give it a try um, and see how those environments can work for you. Excellent. Well, until next time, thank you for joining.